starting the renaissance and the last lap, so to speak, um, you got a lot of dates up here. You don't have to memorize all of these. I'll tell you, I'll put a blue marker by those that are especially important. What, what I'm going to give you is kind of a brief general historical overview before we launch into um, Shakespeare sonnets. And we'll be behind, definitely, uh, because I've got too many sonnets for one day to attempt to do with this kind of background information. But if you remember from whenever it was, when we talked about 1485 and the Battle of Bosworth Field, that was one of the questions on the exam, that's when Henry VII, or at that point, Henry Tudor, Welshman, okay, defeated Richard III, okay, whose bones were just discovered under a car park, a parking lot, in Lincoln. Um, Lincoln? Lester. Lincolnshire. Uh, under a town in Lincolnshire uh, last August. And they've definitively identified them through DNA as his bones. <clears throat> just recently, a, another set of bones was moved from underneath a car park, parking lot, in Winchester that the scuttlebutt is maybe Alfred the Great's bones because his body has been missing um, well, <laughs> for about a thousand years. Uh, but they think they might be his. Anyways, 1485, Henry Tudor defeats Richard III and becomes Henry VII to briefly go through the monarchs. Henry VII has a pretty good reign, 24 years. Okay, He dies, passes the baton on to his son, Henry VIII, who everybody knows, you know, all kinds of bad history about. Um, I, don't, I mean bad history in the sense that nobody really understands, you know, unless you're a Henrician scholar, all the ins and outs of Henry VIII because he was really messed up. And I'm going to say a lot of bad things about him. Um, not the least of which were his marital issues. Okay? The guy just couldn't have a son, which is why he kept getting married. Right? He does finally produce a son, so that when Henry dies in 1547, his son becomes king, even though Edward has two older sisters, half-sisters. They're all half-relation. None of them are full-blood brother, full-blood sister, etc. Because they're mothers by three different mothers, right? Now, Henry VII, thoroughly Catholic, right? Henry VIII, thoroughly Catholic, until he needs to get a divorce from Catherine of Aragon so that he can try another woman to have another child that will be a male child, right? So he tries to get a divorce from Catherine of Aragon, uh, who, if I remember correctly, I'm probably wrong about this, was his brother's wife? His brother died, he married her. And so the reason he tried to get the divorce was, you know, incest. Shouldn't have been married in the first place, right? He does eventually get the divorce, okay? Marries, I don't remember who it is at that point, either Jane Seymour or Lady Jane Grey or one of the other Catholics. Um, and when he gets the divorce, he breaks from Rome, okay? This is 1532, 33, somewhere in that range. It's when he breaks from Rome that he titles himself, okay, the supreme head of the English church. Now, prior to this, in the 1520s, Henry had been given the title by the Pope. Defender of the faith. Because in the 1520s, Henry was writing tracts against this guy, Martin Luther, which we'll come back to um, in a moment. Henry was no intellectual slouch, by the way. Henry was a, a very bright individual. And when he was young, he was a hot stud. He was handsome. He was well-proportioned. 
Okay? Tall, good looking. I mean, he had everything in spades. By the time he died, if you're familiar with what Orson Welles looked like before he died, kind of like that. Extremely large. Go to the Tower of London and go in the armory room and look at the set of armor that Henry had when he was about 23, 24. It's pretty small. And then look at the set of armor he had in the mid 1530s. I'm not kidding. Two of us could fit in there. Okay. Any two of us could fit in there. Okay. So Henry breaks from Rome, sets into motion a whole bunch of activity, which we'll talk about later. And then he dies in 1547. His son, Edward, becomes king. He's pretty young. I think he's like 13 when he takes the reign, and he's 16 or, uh, no, about 19 or 20 when he dies. Okay. So Henry starts as a good Catholic, and he finishes as an Anglican. Now, really, by the time when Henry dies, Anglican's just another word for English Catholic. Doesn't really mean much different. Edward, however is a thorough Protestant. I mean, he is almost a dyed-in-the-wool Calvinist Protestant, okay? which is much, much more hardline than Anglicans. Edward dies, fairly young age, not, nothing untoward about his death, no family plots and things like that. He dies, his eldest half-sister, Mary becomes queen okay, in 1553. She rules for only five years. Why? Because her younger half-sister deposes her and has her killed. I mean, that's the general idea. There's no actual proof that Elizabeth had Mary oft. The evidence is, is pretty clear. Mary is the polar opposite of her brother. She is a thoroughgoing Catholic. Right? I mean, real staunch Catholic. So staunch Catholic, in fact, that she launches persecutions against Protestants. Has them burned at the stake. Has them drawn in court. You can still go to a place um, in Oxford in the, in the middle of... Uh, which is it? Broad Street. In the middle of Broad Street where they had this pillar where two guys, Hugh Latimer and Bishop Ridley, were burned at the stake. Okay, in 1558, in fact. Or 1555. Anyways, 1558, Mary is deposed, not officially. She's kind of like house arrested, sent off to a country manner where she is for a few months and then she mysteriously dies. And Elizabeth becomes queen. Okay. Forty-five year reign. One of the longest in English history. Okay. And it's from her that we get the title of the age that follows the Elizabethan period. There aren't many monarchs that get a, that have their name applied to a period. You have the Elizabethan period, you have the Victorian age. Do we have the Georgian period? Mm, not really. Okay, Hanoverian period? Not really. It's pretty much Elizabethan and Victorian. In the early 20th century, you get the Edwardian period, okay? But that's pretty much it. Now we're in the second Elizabethan period, because she just won't die. She just <laughs> won't let her poor eldest son, you know, take the throne, okay? So, Elizabeth I, she's Protestant, okay? Initially, she's kind of the Protestant that says, channeling Rodney King 400 years before he's born, can't we all just get along? Can't Protestants and Catholics just, you know, like the lion and the lamb, lie down and get along with each other? And she's pretty much 
like that for about the first 30 years. Okay? And the reason I say the first 30 years, how in the world I forgot to put that data, is because in 1588, there's a pretty important event that occurs. Anybody know what it is? It's the Spanish Armada. Okay? Spain tries to invade England. Philip II of Spain, okay, who had been, by the way, earlier in the previous 30 years, wooing Elizabeth. I mean, there were a lot of monarchs who were courting her because she was young, she was available, she was unmarried, and England was a pretty bright place for the uh, picking, so to speak, right? So in the mid-1580s, what begins is there are stirrings of Catholic uprising right, in England. And in 1588, Philip II of Spain launches the Spanish Armada. Over 300 Spanish galleons set sail for England. Okay? And the vast majority of them are destroyed in a hurricane. I think it is of the 300 over, I think it is 350 that set sail, fewer than 30 returned to Spain. The vast majority of them are destroyed in the storm. Francis Drake and, and Walter Raleigh and a few others do hunt down some of the stragglers and, and sink them and such. But when the Spanish Armada is sunk okay, by the winds, the English take that to be a sign. God is not a Catholic, in other words. God is an Elizabethan Anglican. That's why he speaks King James English, by the way. Right? <clears throat> now, when the Spanish Armada invaded, it wasn't just the Spaniards that were coming to invade. There were also English Catholics that were in cahoots, plotting with the Spanish. Okay? Catholics in northern England, because northern England was a, was a Catholic stronghold. All right? So, one of the things that happened as a result of the Spanish Armada is Elizabeth started to crack down on Catholics, on Catholic belief, on Catholic practices, on Catholic priests. So that by the early to mid-1590s, it became a capital offense to be a Catholic priest in England. Okay. In other words, not even to be celebrating the Mass, just to be a Catholic priest in England was cause for death. That's pretty severe. Right? If you've seen um, Skyfall, the latest James Bond film, remember the little scene when they're up at the house? Don't ruin it, sorry. I won't ruin it. It's just one little scene. It won't give it away. The priest, <laughs> the priest hole in the house. Everybody familiar with it? If you've seen the film. The little priest hole is where priests would go down to escape. Okay, And this is in, in that film. That's in Scotland. Why? Because Scotland was part of the... Uh, uh, it wasn't yet, but... Um, Priests were persecuted even more in Scotland because Scotland was even more means of mis an inappropriate term. Scotland was even more right wing, let's say religiously, than um, England. At this point. Okay. In fact, we're going to see some of the authors that we're going to read had family members. John Dunn had family members who were persecuted by the English because of being Catholic. Dunn himself was Catholic. Probably why he never graduated from Oxford. In order to graduate from university, you had to, to swear an oath to the English crown, which meant you're also swearing an oath to the English church. All right? So, Elizabeth Reigns, she also, like her sister, has people burned at the stake, 
Has people drawn and quartered? Has people's tongues cut out? Has hands chopped off to stop them from writing bad things about her? I mean, she was not somebody to be trifled with. Fortunately, she dies in 1603. Okay. And her cousin, all right, James, the sixth of Scotland, becomes James the first of England. I know it's confusing, but he's the sixth James who had ruled Scotland. He's from the Stuart line in Scotland. He becomes James the first of England. Okay. Rules for about 22 years. Not a whole lot mark his rule other than that he is Protestant. He thought he was really smart, but not really. Okay. He was a patron of the arts, as was Elizabeth. Elizabeth apparently loved Shakespeare. Not erotically or anything like that, but she loved his plays. Okay. James dies and his son becomes king, Charles. Charles is quote unquote Protestant, but he marries a woman named Henrietta Maria of Spain, thorough Catholic. Okay. And Charles just has a bad time of it. Out of time. You could get them according to different denominations. You could get five, ten, fifteen, twenty, you know, etc. years out, all depending upon the amount of the donation. And there is a indulgence son interested for, you know, trivial pursuit reasons, <clears throat> named Johannes Tetzel, who was in Germany peddling his indulgences. And he used to sing a little song that went something like, as soon as the coin in the coffer clinks, okay, the soul from purgatory springs. So, as soon as you put your money in the plate, bing, you bought a family member off. You got them out of purgatory. Right? Well, he came around to Wittenberg, Germany one day doing this, and a young Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther really did not like this. Okay? And chased him out of town. Now, he chased him out of town for a couple of reasons. One, theologically, Luther had a problem with the sale and use of indulgences. Two, economically, Luther and other German Christians had a problem with good German money going to Italy. In other words, if you're going to sell indulgences, fine. Keep the money in Germany, though. Let it go to German buildings, etc. Okay? And what this and a few other things eventually led Luther to do was on October 31st of 1517, Luther wrote out a series of, nine, of 95 debating points. Okay? These are 95 issues that he wanted to debate with anyone who was willing to. Okay? Of problems in the church. He wasn't wanting to debate how to overthrow the church. He wasn't wanting to debate how to start the Protestant church. He was wanting to debate how to purify the church, how to cleanse the church, how to make the church what it really should be. Okay? And he had 95 points in this bulleted list as it were, okay? And he nailed these points, this sheet, okay, to the church door at Wittenberg so that anybody who came up to the door would see this list of problems, essentially, okay? Now, what happened as a result of this was those points got copied and distributed. And the reason they got copied was because in about 1470 or 3 or thereabouts, 
a guy by the name of Johannes Gutenberg invented the movable printing press in the West. The Chinese had movable type for 500 years before this, right? But he invented movable type printing for the West so that no longer did you have to rely on some monk to hand copy everything. No. Now you could set up type, put a sheet of paper on, pull the press down, and you have, you know, a page of the Bible. Pull the sheet down again, pull the press down again, and you have another sheet. Pull it down again, and you can get all five, ten pages from a single inking of the impression. And then you reset the type, and you get the second page. Well, you could print multiple copies of a book in one day, as opposed to one copy of a book in a month. <laughs> all right? So... Luther's 95 Theses spread like wildfire, showing the time was ripe for this kind of discussion. Okay? Period of a few years goes by. And in 1521, um, he is invited to what's called the Diet of Worms. Worms is a town in Germany. Okay? And a diet is a meeting. He's invited and he's given safe passage. That is, he is told, you can arrive safely and you will be able to leave safely. Because in the intervening four years, Luther hasn't stopped writing. He's kept writing. And he's kept going farther and farther and farther. So that he has... By 1521, essentially broken from the Catholic Church. Okay? The Diet of Worms, Luther thinks, is going to be an opportunity for discussion, for argument. But when he gets there, what he finds is all of his books, and he's been writing like a busy little beaver, all of his books and pamphlets are piled up, and he is told, recant. Take it all back. Say, oops, I was wrong, I'm sorry. We'll face the consequences. All right? And Luther says, give me a night to think about it. So he spends that night in prayer and contemplation, and he goes back the next day, and according to one of his biographers, Luther says the next morning, unless... I am proven, or unless it is proven to me directly by God, by Holy Scripture, or by my conscience, I cannot take any of this back. Here I stand, I can do no other. Right? His exact words. All right? So he essentially says, no, I'm not going to take any of it back. Why? I'm right, you're wrong. Okay? He leaves, because he has safe passage, and he's kidnapped. But he's kidnapped by his friends and supporters. And he's taken to Wittenberg Castle, where he is holed up, if I remember right, for a period of months or years, where while he is holed up, he translates the Bible into German. <coughs> okay? Now keep in mind, you have the printing press. The Bible gets translated into German. You're sitting there Xeroxing it, left and right. And the Bible is now distributed into the common language of the people. This is the first time, right, that the Bible is available in the language of everyday, ordinary individuals. Prior to this, the Bible was only available in Latin. How do you become conversant in Latin? You go to university. Who goes to university? A very, very, very small percentage of the population. Okay? 
To some, the aristocracy, I mean, some of the aristocracy do. Largely, people who are studying for positions in government or the clergy or the church. That's pretty much it, okay? So what does Luther now do? He puts the Bible in everybody's hands, all right? Now, he's not alone. He starts doing that in the early 1520s. I don't remember to put yeah. And in the early 1520s in England, you also have a guy named Tyndale, who's doing the same for English. Okay? In 1526, Tyndale's New, Pub New Testament is published. He can't publish it in England, however, because Henry will kill him. In fact, Henry had Tyndale hunted down and he. Henry republishes Tyndale's New Testament, essentially as his own in the 1530s. Okay? So, 1526 is the first time you see the New Testament available in the English language. It's published in the Netherlands, by the way. Okay? Not in England, though it does get smuggled into England. After Tyndale, you got another one called the Coverdale, or Coverdale, okay? By the 1660s, it's now appropriate to have the Bible in your own tongue, in your own language. Now you have what's called the Geneva Bible, which is the Great Bible, which is the one Shakespeare would have been familiar with. Okay? And then you get the granddaddy of them all in 1611. Authorized, begun by James. Okay? So... Luther begins, kind of sets into motion in 1517, Halloween, the Protestant Reformation, which is going to have rippling effects all the way down to today. But it's really going to have a lot of rippling effects and a lot of literature we're going to read. Okay? It's unfortunate that we've got Lear in here, not Hamlet, not that Lear's bad or anything. You know, It's commonly regarded as the greatest play in the English language. Um, but Hamlet is a is a play that really deals with a lot of contrary theological kind of stuff. Lear does also, which we'll talk about, as Shakespeare does in his sonnets and such. Okay? Um, what other background stuff? Okay, that's, that's enough background. Let's jump to Shakespeare. Shakespeare's birth and death dates, right? April, yes? Did you go over Utopia? Oh, no, I didn't. Sorry. In 1521, Sir Thomas More writes um, a little book in Latin titled Utopia. What does Utopia mean? It can have two meanings. It can mean beautiful place or no place. That's why a utopian society can be a beautiful world where everything is perfect. Unfortunately, in real human affairs, however, it also happens to be no place. Every utopia that a group of people has ever tried to create, and numerous groups have tried, they always implode. Why? Because people aren't perfect. Because James Madison said, if, peop if men were angels, we'd need no government. The idea of a utopia supposes that we're all angelic, that we all care more about what others want and need than what we ourselves want. Unfortunately, that's not how we are, okay? So what he creates is this world where everything is fine, money is evenly distributed, goods are evenly distributed, there is no want, there is no lack, there is no poverty, etc., etc. Okay? And we see this kind of writing, you know, played out throughout English literature. Okay? Um, 
Jonathan Swift later on is going to write Gulliver's Travels, where we see utopian societies that aren't really all that utopian. And then you come up to, you know, the 19th century, and we have utopian societies. 20th century, we get Brave New World, which is really a dystopia, okay, as well as a few others, okay? So that's why it's here. Moore writes all kinds of tracts against Martin Luther, because Moore is a thoroughgoing Catholic. Moore is the one who, when Henry wants to break from Catherine of Aragon, wants to divorce Catherine of Aragon, and wants to seek a divorce from the church, he goes to Sir Thomas More first, who is his chancellor. More refuses. That is, More says, no, you can't get a divorce. It's wrong. Now, More and Henry were friends. Social friends. They, they got along well together. And More is executed by Henry because he will not support what Henry wants. And Henry needs Sir Thomas More's support because Sir Thomas More is well respected by the entire English population. Sir Thomas More, if I remember correctly, is now a saint in the Catholic Church. Okay? He is the great uncle of the wife of one of the poets we're going to read later. Okay? John Dunn, whose family, who had a brother and an uncle die for their Catholic faith. Okay? That's the only reason I have him up there. Okay, Shakespeare. He was born probably on April 23rd, 1564. We say probably because we do not have an actual birth certificate. Yes, they did have birth certificates then. Okay? But we met, we don't have Shakespeare's. What we do have is his baptismal certificate or date, which doesn't say when he was born. Okay? But most scholars say he was born on April 23rd, which is rather fitting for this one. April 23rd is St. George Day. Okay? George and the Dragon, right? The guy who slew the dragon. St. George is the patron saint of England. So it's kind of fitting that Shakespeare, kind of the patron writer of England, is born on the patronal feast day of England. Now, he dies on his birthday, 1660. Notice how many years that is. Okay. 36 and 16, 52 years. In other words, if I were Shakespeare, I'd have about eight months to go. All right? Now think about this for a moment. Does everybody have all this? <coughs> He's born in 64. He gets married in the early 80s. <coughs> Shotgun wedding and all that. In the period from 1585 to about 92 okay, are called the lost years. For the simple reason we have no idea what Shakespeare was doing during this period. We know where he was in 1583 and up to 1585. Because in 1585, I think it is, the twins were born. 1583, he has one child, or two children, hold on. Um, I can never remember. Your introduction doesn't say. 1583, I think, is when the eldest child was born. 1585, I believe, is when the twins are born. And then he disappears. No documentary evidence at all of what Shakespeare is doing. But in 1592, he's referred to by another writer in London. Referred to derisively. Because this other writer is jealous. Okay. So it's pretty safe to assume he'd been in London for at least a couple of years. But 
We call this seven-year period the lost years. Right? All kinds of theories abound as to what he was doing. Some of these theories date from almost Shakespeare's lifetime, just a little bit after his death. Okay? For example, one says that Shakespeare was the headmaster of a school. Okay? No evidence. No list of headmasters, no schools have Shakespeare listed as headmaster anywhere. Another one is that he was a traveling actor with a group of actors. Could be, but there's no proof. Okay? That is, we have lists of groups of actors who travel throughout England. None of those lists name William Shakespeare. Okay? Another one is that he went and traveled on the continent. Could be. No evidence. This is what I mean when I say we have no proof of what he was doing. He, he might have just been sitting at home with Anne writing plays and poetry. But if he was, he was doing it very quietly. And he was never signing his name to anything. Because we do have six um, signatures of Shakespeare's from later in life. Okay, Spells his name three different ways. Why? Because spelling was not uniform by any means. Um, so, I mean, it's not like he shies away, you know, like he wants to be off the grid. So, nothing like that. It's just he's silent for whatever reason. But apparently, by 1592, he is in London, and he is in writing. So let's take 1592 as his beginning point. We can then take, let's say 1613, as his last date for writing. The Tempest is usually dated, I think, in 1611, but we know Shakespeare helped out with a couple of other writers and their plays, the last one of which I believe was 1613. So how many years is that? It's 21 years. Okay. So what did he do in 21 years? He wrote, depending upon which plays you think are actually Shakespeare's or not, 37 plus plays some people will say 39, because they'll say, My Two Noble Kinsmen, which is a play by Beaumont and Fletcher that Shakespeare possibly helped, and then there's, there's this other one. It seems. But 37, we know, have Shakespeare byline, as it were. Right? So 37 plays, what kind of plays are these? These aren't little, my language here, don't mean to offend anybody. Little rinky-dink, one-act, you know, 20-minute plays. These are all full five-act plays. They take, on average, three to three and a half hours to perform. 37 into 21. Almost two a year. Hamlet, Macbeth, Lear. Othello, Romeo and Juliet, Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, All's Well That Ends Well, Twelfth Night, Winter, almost two a year. That is huge. But that's not all. 154 sonnets. Sonnets are 14 line poems. Do the math. It's almost 2,000 lines right there. What else? Four big long poems, several hundred lines each. I mean, the guy just can't shut up. He just keeps writing. And he doesn't necessarily, he, he's not like, I won't pick an author. He's not like some authors who start off, you know, like a blazing meteor, and they finish like a dying ember. They have nothing really to say, but they keep on writing. 
He finishes. The last play Shakespeare himself personally writes is The Tempest, which is not a slouch by any means. It's one of his greatest plays. It's a problem play in that, you know, it, it deals with some issues that aren't finally perfectly resolved. And then what does he do? Apparently in 1611, he leaves London and goes back to Stratford to live with his wife, who he's been away from since 1592. Okay? Because Anne Hathaway was the original Anne Hathaway, was not in London. She was back in Stratford, probably managing the property. Because Shakespeare bought a big house called New Place in the 1590s, which was a big house. All right? He was apparently sending money back to support the family. We have no idea how much he saw his children. We do know the twins died early, okay, in the 1590s. Um, so, I mean, he had some issues going on. Okay. Shakespeare's family was Catholic. This we know. Whether Shakespeare himself personally was, you know, there are uh, hundred books have been written thousands of books have been written on what was Shakespeare's religious inclinations and such. It depends on who you read. Some will say he's a thoroughgoing Protestant. Others will say, no, he was a thoroughgoing Catholic, but he was a secret Catholic because he realized to be Catholic in Elizabethan, Elizabethan England was dangerous. Okay? But he apparently did have Elizabeth's ear. She apparently liked him. According to one anecdote, Shakespeare writes the two Henry IV plays, Henry IV Part I, Henry IV Part II. And one of the most famous characters in those plays is the character of Sir John Falstaff, an old fallen knight, okay? No longer as knightly as he ought to be. Spends his time getting drunk, robbing people, and visiting whores with the future king of England, no less, okay? And apparently, after one of the productions, Elizabeth told Shakespeare, write us, using the word we, write us a play about Sir John Falstaff. She wants, and what Shakespeare goes and does is he writes The Merry Wives of Windsor, which is all about Sir John Falstaff trying to get in and out of the beds of The Merry Wives of Windsor. He chooses Windsor probably intentionally because who has a castle in Windsor? The queen. Okay. It's the oldest inhabited castle in England. In fact, it's the oldest inhabited castle um, in England. Okay. So he's doing a lot. Now, what we're going to talk about first are his sons. We don't know exactly when the sonnets are written, but we do know <coughs> that some, at least, of them are written by the mid-1590s. Why? Because we have references to them. One, um, one writer refers, I think it is in 96, 98, refers to Shakespeare's sugared sonnets. And what he means by that is his sweet sonnets, how beautiful they are, okay? They don't get published, however, until 1609. All is one big group. And what's even more important than that is we don't know how they get published. We don't know by whom they are published. All we know is they are published. Hold on a second. Let me see if this thing's on. Yes, it is. Uh, projector. Okay.
Hopefully this will come up right. Shakespeare sonnets never before imprinted. And you have where they're printed down here. Um, where do we have? Come on. Okay. This is what's called um, the It's not the letter, it's not the dedication. Oh, I can't remember. What this is, is telling us how the sonnets came to be. But we don't know who wrote this. We know what this stands for. Okay, this is Thomas Thorpe. This is the guy who actually published them. But notice what it says. To the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W. H., we have multiple theories as to who W.H. is, but we don't know for sure. All happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet wisheth the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth. We don't know if Shakespeare wrote this, okay, and if he did, what he meant by it. Because to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets kind of implies that whoever Mr. W.H. is, this person is the inspiration for the sonnets. And like I said, we've got a, a variety of options okay, for who W.H. is. And I think your introduction goes in and talks about that a little bit. Could be William Herbert, 3rd Earl of Pembroke, or it could be um, Henry Riosley, just turn the W's around, okay? Another person, the Earl of uh, Herbert, is one that Shakespeare previously dedicated poems to. Henry Riosley is one that Shakespeare previously dedicated poems to. So this is very enigmatic. If you were able to prove conclusively who W.H. was, and that this was written by Shakespeare, and that Shakespeare wrote the sonnets, for WH, you'd be able to name your chair of English at any university in the world. I mean Oxford. And they would pay you a huge amount of money. Okay? Because this is one of the great critical questions um, which page is that? A2R, of English literature. And then it just goes right into well, it doesn't get any larger than that, okay, of the sonnets. We don't even know if the order of the sonnets show up in this edition, if this is what Shakespeare wanted. Because in 1609, they're not printed by Shakespeare. It doesn't say the sonnets of William Shakespeare printed by me on X, Y, or Z date. Okay. Turn that off. Yes. So, we have these sonnets. And we're going to begin not with number one, but with number two. Now the sonnets are many of the sonnets. One through one twenty-six are generally addressed to a golden-haired youth or a young man with long flowing golden hair. You know, think uh, Chris Hemsworth as Thor. I guess. In fact, that's kind of a, no, nah, it's not a good analogy. 
because you can never mistake Chris Hemsworth for a woman. Um, one of the sonnets is going to imply that you can mistake this gentleman for a woman. Okay? But what we're told throughout is that whoever this guy is, he's the kind of person that when he walks into a room, everybody's head turns. Men's and women's. Okay? The first 20 or so sonnets... are all generally about the same thing. Reprodu reproduction. Go have children. Okay? For one specific reason. You are so drop-dead gorgeous that it would be a shame for you to die and for your beauty not to live on after you. You would be robbing the world of great beauty if you died without passing on your genetic material. Okay? That's what Sonnet 1, From Fairest Creatures We Desire Increase, means. Right? You go to a wedding, don't you love to see the happy couple that are just beautiful? I mean, how many of us really, let's be completely honest, Want to go to a wedding and see somebody with one ear up here and their mouth down here and an eye over here, you know, and then a spouse the same. You go, no, you know, please. Okay? That's why he says at the end of Sonnet 1, pity the world or else this glutton be. To eat the world's due by the grave indeed. What's the world's due? Your beauty being passed on. Okay. Number two. One of Shakespeare's most famous sonnets. Okay. So I said these are about, these first 20 are about reproduction. But there is a larger theme throughout the sonnets. One that Shakespeare loves and it's time. Another, appearance versus reality. How things appear to be and what they really are. When forty winters shall besiege thy brow and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field, thy youth's proud livery, so gazed on now, will be a tattered weed of small worth held. Then being asked where all thy beauty lies, where all the treasure of thy lusty days, to say within thine own deep sunken eyes, were an all-eating shame and thriftless praise. How much more praise deserve thy beauty's use, if thou couldst answer, this fair child of mine shall sum my count and make my old excuse, proving his beauty by succession thine. This were to be new made when thou art old, and see thy blood warm when thou feelst it cold. Okay? So you have both time and this idea. Notice, when forty winters shall besiege thy brow. Okay. How long did Shakespeare live? He was only fifty-two when he died. Right? and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field. When you're 40 years old and you're old and wrinkled, he says, your youth's proud livery, that is, the fair complexion, the beauty, the good looks you had as a youth, so gazed on now, now when? Long before 40 years. Okay? They will be a tattered weed of small worth held. Think of some actor, don't think of a 40-year-old actor, think of some actor today who's maybe, let's say, 60 or 70, and what that actor looked like at 20 or 30. Someone who's kind of gone to pot, gone downhill. Okay? What's the difference? That's what he's saying. People will look at you when you're 40 and say, man, 
What happened? Mickey Rourke is a good example. Talk about some hard living. Okay? Mickey Rourke, geez, 30 years ago, was really handsome. Now, not so much. Looks like he's been under a semi, both living and being run over for quite a while. <laughs> then, that is when you're 40 years old, and someone asks, what happened? Then you could say, all the treasure of thy lusty days. What? To say, it's, it's still here. Look, look deep in my eyes, you'll see it. Like if you've ever seen the film Hook, how many of you have seen that? Okay. When the little black kid, one of the lost boys, gets exactly gets Robin Williams' face and he starts, you know, pushing, you know, and he goes, Oh, there you are, Peter. He sees where? In the eyes. He says, that would be an all-eating shame and thriftless praise. There'd be no, no boon, no reward from that. No, no, no. Here's what you need to do. How much more praise would be deserved of thy beauty's use? If you could answer. Look. Here it is. Here's my beauty from my lusty days. Here's my child. Look there. This, this child, were to be new made when thou art old. I mean, what is the whole plastic surgery industry about? To be new made when you are old. I mean, just look at Bruce Jenner. <laughs> or, you know, so many others. Joan Rivers who's like 180 years old. You know? She has so much plastic on her, that's all she is now. And see thy blood warm when thou feelst it cold. Now he's playing upon this Renaissance notion that the older you get, the more cold your blood runs. Okay? Which also has other parts to it. The younger you are, the more... How do I put this? the more easily your blood flows because it's, it's um, very, what's the term I want? Well, it, partly it's passion, but it, it's literally that your blood flows freely because it's smooth. But the older you get, like my age, okay, your blood starts to coagulate. It gets thicker and more viscous so that it's harder for the heart to pump the blood throughout the vein. So that by the time you're really old, what's happened? Your blood's cold and thick. Anybody think of a good image? It's like gravy. Like gravy in a refrigerator. <laughs> or bacon grease. <laughs> that you let sit out, you know. You know, you cook in bacon grease and it's all nice and popping and everything. And then you let it sit on the in the skillet for a while. What does it do? It just hardens. It's, that's what happens to your blood the older you get. You want it to be hot and popping and burning people, in other words. Okay? That's a good son. I mean, th look at what he's saying there. Strike while you're young. It's a carpe diem poem, essentially. Seize the day. Okay? Now go to number 12. When I do count the clock that tells the time. Here we are again, time again. And see the brave day sunk in the hideous night. When I behold the violet past prime and sable curls all silvered o'er with white. When lofty trees I see barren of leaves which erst from heat did canopy the head. And summer's green all girded up in sheaves. Sorry, can't it be the herd? And summer's green all girded up in sheaves, borne on the beer with white and bristly beard. Then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou among the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake, and die as fast as they see others grow. 
and nothing against time's scythe can make defense, save breed to brave him when he takes the hints. One thing about Shakespeare's sonnet is Shakespeare writes the classic kind of what's called English or Shakespearean sonnet, which is made up of three quatrains, okay, four line stanzas with a rhyme scheme within those, and then a final couplet. Right? The final couplet in Shakespeare almost always sums up what is happening in the first three quatrains. In other words, the first three quatrains, those first 12 lines in Shakespeare, are often like premise one, premise two, premise three, conclusion. All right? So that the couplet is the conclusion. This is different from an Italian sonnet. Right? Italian sonnets have a different structure. Italian sonnets are made up of an octave and what's called the sestet. Octave, lines 1 through 8, obviously, and the sestet, lines 9 through 14. Okay? And usually, after line 8 in an Italian sonnet, you get what's called the volta, which means turn. It's a, a change of direction. It's often a contrast. So that line 9 will begin with something like but, however, for. Okay. Now what Shakespeare likes to do is Shakespeare likes to work this volta into his sonnets. So that the end of line 8 or the end of the second quatrain, he'll often have this turn of emphasis. Okay. Look at um, number 18. This is usually anthologized in, in, you know, 100 great love poems or 100 beautiful love poems. But it's addressed to a woman. Excuse me, it's addressed to a man. Now, let me throw this out now. The golden-haired youth that the speaker of the poems is, ad is addressing. Two things. The speaker of the poems does not equal Shakespeare. Okay? The speaker of the poems is a persona created by Shakespeare. Where people get into trouble is they want to read the poems autobiographically. And they want to say the speaker of the poems is Shakespeare, and that what is being written about is a homoerotic love affair that Shakespeare is writing to his homosexual lover. It's not true. Okay? You have a persona addressing a male. But even within that fiction, the persona is going to make it pretty clear when we get to Sonnet 20 that this isn't a homosexual, a homosexual <laughs> affair or relationship at all. Okay, So the speaker isn't Shakespeare. Number 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, And often is his gold complexion dimmed, And every fair from fair sometime declines, By chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer, notice the volta, But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderst in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. 
So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Okay? So what's he doing there? Shall I compare you to a summer's day? The opening sounds beautiful. But what's he really saying? Let's not imagine a London summer. Let's imagine Murfreesboro summer. Let's say August 6th. What's Murfreesboro usually like? You know, Mads is sitting there shaking her head. It's miserable. You know, I can remember, I don't know how many years where the first two weeks of August are over 100 degrees. That's what he's saying. Should I really compare you to a summer's day? No. Why? You're more lovely and more temperate. More even-mannered. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Okay. May, early summer, is the implication. And summer's lease, what? Have all too short a date. Now, Shakespeare was living in the end of about a 500-year period okay, where there is gradual cooling going on. You know, all the global warming nonsense. It's cyclical, folks. It's cyclical. Okay? I know Jason Banks is going, now you're on that show. Okay? In fact, in... What year was it? 1745, I think it was. Uh, they had snow in London in June. Okay. June. So when he says summer's lease have all too short a date, what's he mean? Louder? Yeah. Too soon. Too soon. Okay. I mean, the Brits really hate it if they don't get nice weather in July and August. Why? Because September comes and the bad weather comes with it. Okay. So... Sometime, too hot the eye of heaven shines. I've been in London before. One time when I was teaching there, in fact, the summer of 2003, the day we left, it hit 101. It was the hottest ever on record in London. Ever. Because, keep in mind, they don't know what AC is. And they haven't figured out the recipe for ice. The only place you can get ice in London is American establishments, Pizza Hut, McDonald's, Subway, okay? Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dim. Well, how is his gold complexion dim? Clouds. Last couple summers that I've been over there, you know, from my perspective, just been fantastic. Temperature in the mid, 60s to low 70s, cloudy most days, and drizzle. And then I come back to, you know, Murfreesboro, that's 105 degrees, okay? And every fair from fair, some time declines. Sometime doesn't mean, well, like we mean sometimes. It means always. Fair from fair declines. What happens to beauty? Doesn't matter how beautiful you are, it won't stay. Exactly, it fades. How does it fade? By chance or nature's changing course, untrimmed. Well, trimmed means that, like when you trim out a tree for Christmas, what do you do? You decorate it, you make it all beautiful and everything. So nature's unchanging course, or nature's changing course, untrimmed, it means you take all the decorations off. What's that poor Christmas tree look like after Christmas? After you move all the decorations? A dead tree. What do you do with it? Burn it. <laughs> this is what happens to beauty. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. It's almost like Keats's ode on a Grecian urn. 
nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. That is, nor will your eternal summer lose the beauty that you own, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, in his darkness, when in eternal lines to time thou cross. Just think about how beautiful that line is for me. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. Eternal lines, like the lines on a face. I mean, every now and then you'll see photographs of, you know, some wise and old Native American woman who, I mean, she doesn't have a smooth spot on her face. The face is just entire wrinkles and lines. That's one of the images there. But what's the other image? Lines. These lines that are eternal. Eternal how long? So long as men can breathe or eyes can see. So long lives this. This what? This poem. This eternal summer. And this gives life to thee. I mean, look at this. Here it is, 2013. 404 years later, we are still reading this poem. And people actually, believe it or not, they do read Shakespeare's sonnets, even when they're not assigned in a class. You still have bookstores that sell just individual volumes of Shakespeare's sonnets. Okay. Number 20. This is the one that proves this isn't a homosexual love affair or relationship. It's talking about a different kind of love. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted hast thou. Okay. That is, your face was painted to be a woman's, and it was painted by nature herself. The master mistress of my passion. Thou, the master mistress. Well, that's kind of gender confused. A woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change, as is false women's fashion. Now, you can take that line to mean a couple of different things. It can mean, men, watch out for women because they're all false. Okay? As is false women's fashion, that false can be applied to all women. Or he might just be saying, not all women, but only false women's fashion. And I, more bright than theirs... Less false in rolling. More bright than theirs. Shakespeare is playing on this old medieval notion that the way we see is our light, our eyes shoot out beams of light. Okay? And so when we look somebody deeply in the eyes, often what happens is we're blinded by the light. That is, we're stupefied. And this can be really dangerous when you gaze into somebody else's eyes. Because your eye beams twist. Eye sex is kind of what it is. Okay? We'll see this when we talk about another poem later on. Less false in rolling. What does he mean by rolling? Well, what do false women's eyes do? They look at you, and then they look at you, and then they look at you, and then at you, and then at you. And then at you. In other words, they're cheating. They're inconstant women. Gilding the object whereupon it gazes. Well, how does it gild? What does gild mean? Covers it with gold. Not literal gold here, but with light. So what does it do? It makes it look better than what it really is. Right? A man in hue, the gloss tells you appearance, all hues in his controlling. What that means is, he comes into the room, all hues, all appearances turn 
and look at this guy. Okay? Which steals men's eyes and women's souls amazeth. In other words, guys look at him and they kind of go, it's just not fair. And women look at him and go, <laughs> and for a woman wert thou first created. He doesn't mean for to please a woman. He means you were supposed to be a woman until nature, as she wrought thee, fell a doting. That is, nature sitting here working on the body, and she just forgets what she's doing. And by addition, me of the defeated. She added something to you that therefore defeated my purpose, my desire. By adding one thing to my purpose, nothing. That is, by adding one thing to you, she made nothing of my purpose. It's one meaning. Another meaning was his purpose, the speaker's purpose, in you was nothing. He wanted there to be nothing where nature added something. Right? How do you represent nothing? Numerically, how do you represent nothing? Zero, a whole. Where I wanted nothing, a whole, nature added something. But since she, and then Shakespeare likes he's going, okay, you guys still don't get this? Okay, let me spell it out for you. I just don't want to say that proves that it's not gay. Hold on. But since she pricked thee out for women's pleasures, or pleasure, mine be thy love, and thy love's use their treasure. In other words, let women use the one thing nature added to you for their treasure. But give me your love. So what does he mean by love? It's an emotional thing, or it's a spiritual component, if you want. It's an intellectual desire. It's not a physical desire. Because he's saying, let women have your physical pleasure. Okay? Let's stop, since I'm late, let's stop there and we'll pick up with where we are when we come back.